Primero quiero, quiero agradecer especialmente a Darío Pulfer, pero tanto a OEI y Vertic, eh, como a Adrián Canelotto y al UNIPE, que son quienes organizan este, este espacio, este encuentro, esta conversación. Con... Tenemos, eh, tengo el honor y tenemos el honor de, de compartir este espacio con eh, Pierre Levy, un, eh, un pensador que, que nos va a ayudar a creo, a, a, a revisar algunas cuestiones que venimos trabajando en este auditorio, si no me equivoco y no me falla la visión, que no es muy buena mi visión, soy hipermétrope, pero creo arriesgarme a, a decir que, que estamos rodeados de funcionarios del Ministerio de Educación, de intelectuales vinculados al campo de la cultura, la educación y la comunicación, de expertos en tecnología educativa eh, y en el campo de los desafíos ciberpedagógicos de esta época y, y algunos más que no conozco y que seguramente también tienen interés en escucharte. Eh, la verdad es que eh, simplemente eh, para empezar a escucharte poder decir que y a mí me gusta plantear esto en estos términos, y nosotros en el Ministerio de Educación de la Nación lo pensamos también de este modo. Nosotros estamos trabajando eh, para fortalecer y mejorar aquello que sucede en las escuelas. En este país tenemos más de 50.000 escuelas. Y no podemos dejar de lado que eh, somos herederos, o de alguna manera la escuela en la que trabajamos eh, hereda la lógica de la imprenta, que no es lo mismo que la lógica de la letra con sangre entra, esa es una lógica escolar eh, que nos antecede y tiene que ver con nuestros abuelos o con nuestros padres. Pero en esta época tenemos el desafío de trabajar fuertemente con una escuela que viene de la imprenta y que enseña bajo la lógica de la imprenta, pero también tenemos la responsabilidad y el desafío de educar eh, a las nuevas generaciones que laten al ritmo cardíaco del siglo XXI y fundamentalmente de la cibercultura y todos los desafíos de la cultura digital. Y en ese sentido, eh, los que estamos especialmente en una encrucijada somos... Eh, seguramente en primer término los adultos y particularmente los adultos que nos animamos al desafío de educar y de educar en la escuela en esta época. Y la verdad es que poder escucharte, leerte y poder eh, aproximarnos a alguna de las cuestiones que, que vos planteás en, en torno a la inteligencia colectiva como desafío de esta época y aquello que nos toca particularmente los educadores, de alguna manera tiene que ver no solamente con lo que vos llamás la antropología del ciberespacio, sino fundamentalmente con revisar la gramática de la escuela, porque uno de los desafíos que te propones es revisar la propia gramática en la construcción de la información cibernética. Yo creo que nosotros, para enseñar... Eh, frente a esta doble exigencia de la escuela de la imprenta y la escuela de la cibercultura, tenemos eh, aún, eh, es mayor el desafío de esta revisión de la gramática escolar. Y cuando hablo de la gramática me refiero especialmente a ciertas fuerzas eh, que tienden a conservar más que a transformar, y que son eh, fuerzas que existen en las instituciones, pero especialmente en los sujetos que habitan en las instituciones. Por lo tanto, a mí me parece que estos espacios son especialmente fructíferos para, para poder pensar eh, estos territorios que aún, eh, por suerte, no están demasiado institucionalizados, estos territorios que no se han anquilosado a veces como la propia gramática de la escuela eh, de la modernidad, y me parece que para aquellos que asumimos el desafío político educativo de transformar la escuela y especialmente ampliar el derecho de los estudiantes en términos de acceso a la cultura y particularmente a la cultura y a la cibercultura, permitime 
Pierre que te diga que este gobierno educativo, este gobierno nacional y, y el Ministerio de Educación hace unos días entregó la computadora 4.752.000 eh, y todos los estudiantes secundarios de las escuelas de gestión estatal de la República Argentina han accedido a las computadoras junto a sus docentes y también los estudiantes que van a las escuelas de educación especial y todos aquellos estudiantes que se forman para ser docentes y todos los docentes de estos estudiantes. Y esto es una política de ampliación de derechos que nos permite eh, justamente eso, reponer el derecho con un Estado que se hace garante y responsable en términos de acceso a... A la, alfabetización, a la alfabetización digital, y, y vos hablás permanentemente de las nuevas tecnologías. Y la verdad es que nosotros tenemos que estar atentos a que la tecnología es nada más ni nada menos que eso, que tecnología no resuelve nada por sí misma. Pero en alguna época fue la tiza una revolución tecnológica, en otra época fue la calculadora, para aprender matemática en la escuela. Y yo diría que la propia escuela es una tecnología de gobierno, por ejemplo, o una tecnología moral respecto a la alfabetización y la formación de los niños. Por lo tanto, no hay, no hay que creerse eh, que la computadora resuelve todo, pero tampoco eh, subestimar el enorme poder de herramienta que tiene para transformar la vida de las personas y la relación de las personas. Así que... Yo creo que, que con tu aporte los educadores vamos a poder eh, seguir sintiéndonos incómodos porque justamente hay algo que tiene que ver con la incomodidad eh, en la manera de poder hacerle frente a estos desafíos eh, de la cibertecnología en términos políticos, didácticos, pedagógicos, pero fundamentalmente de ruptura generacional. Entonces, la verdad es que para nosotros como Ministerio y en, en, para mi persona en nombre del Ministerio es, es un honor eh, presentarte, eh, pero presentarte eh, en el marco de estos desafíos que tenemos como política educativa, en donde hemos realizado muchas eh, transformaciones en torno a este tema, pero es mucho más lo que nos falta por hacer. Yo diría que eh, hay un técnico de fútbol que una vez dijo una frase respecto a su equipo y dijo, la base está. La base está, es una manera de decir, las condiciones básicas están dadas. Eh, y lo, los que están aquí presentes seguramente se acuerdan de esa frase. Perdón, quizás no es muy académica ni tecnológica, pero es claramente ilustrativa. Yo pienso y nosotros creemos que la base para el desarrollo de una educación eh, en el marco de estos desafíos de la cibercultura, está y lo que tenemos que lograr ahora es enseñar más y mejor con estas tecnologías, que son tecnologías de enseñanza, de aprendizaje, de gobierno, de dominación, pero también de emancipación. Por lo tanto, son todo eso y es cada una de esas cosas. Así que, eh, elogiando la incomodidad que supone escuchar intelectuales que nos hacen pensar, porque también la escuela a veces ha sido una maquinaria... Eh, diseñada para que los demás no piensen, sino que repitan. Nosotros creemos que la escuela es una tecnología para liberar, si no, no sirve. Por lo tanto, eh, en el trabajo de una tecnología para liberar, pensemos en esa clave de la escuela y también pensemos en esa clave a las computadoras, a las 4.700.000 y pico de mil computadoras y a estos espacios en los que podamos eh, escuchar a alguien que nos ayude a pensar. Así que eh, aquí va esta presentación y de vuelta el honor de, de, de estar aquí para, para abrir y darte la palabra. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And, uh... Thank you also to Ibertic for inviting me in, in Buenos Aires. I, I will begin this talk about uh, collective intelligence for educators by uh, a, a little historic, historical reminder, because if we concentrate only on the present situation, we cannot really understand what's going on. 
We don't need just a photograph of the situation to understand it. We need to have the whole film, the dynamics behind the current situation. What were the previous stage that led to the current situation? So this is uh, what you can see here is a static image, but you should think about it like a dynamic emergence through history. My, my point of departure was the specificity of the human race, which is symbolic manipulation. Of course, the animals can communicate, but they cannot talk, they don't create images, they don't play music, they don't have a history of art, they don't have a political history, and so on. They don't have a, a symbolic universe. So if we consider what is really ours, this ability to manipulate symbol and to think and to communicate with these symbols, the way we manipulate these symbols, I think, is the key to the understanding of the cultural evolution. So the first uh, big mutation in the manipulation of symbols was the invention of writing. And by the way, not only writing, but also architecture, agriculture, and so on. So uh, at, the, at this first, uh, at, at the time of this first cultural revolution, symbols became uh, uh, able to, to conserve themselves. Okay. When, I, when I speak, my words go away with the wind. When I write, the writing stays there by itself, even if I die, for example. So the second great mutation was the invention of um, symbolic systems that were easy easier to manipulate than the first writing systems, like hieroglyphs, for example. For example, the invention of the alphabet, where there are only 30 signs, and you can say everything you want with only 30 signs that note the sound. Or the invention of the Indo-Arabic numeration system, where you can express any number that you want with only 10 numerals by using the position of the numerals. And also this kind of notation of the, of the numbers helps the arithmetical operations because you use always the same algorithm to do, for example, a multiplication. Then the next in great invention was the invention of the printing press. And after the printing press, the invention of photography, radio, television, and all the technologies that multiply or copy and distribute automatically the signs. And now we are at the, just at the beginning, in fact, of a new uh, revolution in the manipulation of symbol. It is the, uh, this ability that we have now to transform automatically the symbols, not only to copy them, but to transform them automatically. At each stage corresponds uh, economic, political, epistemological institutions or conventions. Okay. What I want to say is that there is a correspondence between the basic stage where we are in our ability to manipulate symbols and the kind of culture 
or civilization we live in. Okay. So currently, the situation embeds, of course, all the previous stages. I mean, our symbols are self-conservative. Uh, they they, um, we still use the alphabet and the Indo-Arabic nu numeration system. We still have, of course, and they are very powerful uh, technologies to multiply and disseminate symbols. But in addition of all these properties, we have this new ability to transform automatically the symbol. So the new communication space um, is ubiquitous. It contains all the possible information, all the real information. Uh, all these informations are interconnected and people communicate between, between them, between each other by the medium of this ubiquitous sphere, by the medium of this collective memory of or infosphere that is everywhere. So now at each stage corresponds a particular stage in the uh, history of education. So you know that in uh, oral cultures, there are no schools. People learn by identification, imitation, by living with, with the other in the same tribe. The school has been invented by the scribes, the professional caste that were responsible for reading and writing, and these people were working for the temple and the palaces in the ancient times. Okay? And the school was very close to the temple. But this first school was uh, really for a, 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 a very small group of people. It was for uh, professional specialists. The, second st the, 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 the next step uh, with the um, use of the alphabet in the big alphabetic empires like the Greek, the Latin, the Arabic empires or in the U Europe of the Middle Age. This was called the liberal education. So in this case, the education was for an, not for a, a group of professional specialists, but for a political, religious, and economic elite. So people were studying the classic. They were trained in critical thinking. They were able to design um, uh, persuasive discourses. So more or less, this liberal education corresponds to the ideal of the secondary education now. At the time of the printing press, that was also the time of the nation state, the time of the uh, industrial economy, the school was intended for everybody and was um, uh, mandatory for everybody with their uniform programs. So today, in the, the new environment, I think that the, the pedagogy will, should be completely different because we know that the knowledge is evolving very quickly. There is a, a direct access to the knowledge created collaboratively in the infosphere. And uh, uh, le le let's say that the, the, the learning will be uh, lifelong, collaborative, and not necessarily 
always related to the physical presence in the classroom. And also we can say that currently there is almost no reason why uh, we should pay to have a textbook, for example. Okay, because the reproduction of the, the information is no, at almost no cost. Another way to, to, to think of the, of the current change is to um, reflect, for example, uh, about what, is, what was a university. Uh, a university was uh, um, a group of people that gathered around a library to learn from this stock of knowledge. Today, this constraint of having to, to be close to the source of knowledge or to be close to the tradition in the form of a physical memory uh, is not relevant anymore. So the relationship with the space is different. The uh, social relation is also different. Of course, learning has always been collaborative, but now we can collaborate, exchange, and work together with people who are not close to us geographically. Basically, let's say our situation is that you, I, I, I just spoke about the, 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 the universities of the ancient time, <laughs> but today it's the same. We gather around a, a kind of wealth of data and we interact with this uh, uh, commonwealth of data through algorithms or software or applications, call it as you want. And the communication is not, is of course, we can communicate people to people, okay? I, I spoke to, I speak to you, you speak to me, we receive tweets, we send tweets and so on. So this is the communication person to person. The main part of the current communication is through the common memory. We transform this common memory and this transformation sends a message to the other people who share the same memory. So anytime that we send a tweet, anytime that we like a post, every time that we add a post on our blog, every time that we buy a book on Amazon, and so on, and so on. We transform the relationship between the data in the common memory. So in this new communication environment, everybody is an author. We can write texts, post photographs, create videos, create music, and so on. We don't need to go through a publisher or an editor and so on. We are free to, uh, let's say we are empowered as authors. And at the same time, we are also librarians. For example, when we tag, uh, when we put a hashtag on our uh, tweets or in our posts on Facebook, or when we tag something on YouTube, okay? So we impose categories on information, exactly like the librarians, exactly. And also we, we are also critics when we write our comments uh, on a, a, about a blog post or about a book or about some music or about some photograph and so on. So there is a, a distribution, a um, kind of democratization of the function, of the cultural function of the critique. I will go further. Um, today, there are people that are specialists of data analysis. 
they, they say we are specialists of big data, we have very complex statistical methods that you don't understand, and we will extract knowledge from your enormous flow of data because you, you cannot do anything with such an immense quantity of data. But I think that in, I don't know, in five, ten years, these tools will be in the hands of everybody. Like, you know, in the, in the 50s or in the uh, 70s, the computers were something very expensive that only scientists could manipulate and so on. But uh, 30 years after, everybody has a computer. If you look at this, at this list, you can see that there are a lot of contemporary practices that are um, giving examples of this basic structure. For example, the uh, open science, the, the, the researchers are sharing their data, their algorithms, and their results. A lot of authors now uh, uh, stamp on their production uh, a free uh, uh, a license that authorizes anybody to use and reuse it. In the, 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 the movement of the free software is going in the same direction. All the programmers work collaboratively to improve the programs. In this case, the data is the algorithm. So I, I will not go through all the points of the list, but you can imagine. Basically, it, we, we are speaking about open, collaborative, uh, 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 collab open, collaborative creation. And in fact, this trend is affecting uh, all the, the, the different economic areas. It happens in the news, it happens in the, in the publishing industry, it happens in marketing, it happens almost everywhere. Now, the, the problem is to Okay, to rethink education in this environment. The first thing that we have to, to realize is that there is no more ultimate authority that will tell us what is good, what is bad, what is true, what is false, and so on. Because everybody can write, everybody can read, everybody can criticize, and so on. So, in a way, it's a little bit frightening. We should exploit this new situation for the best. So, uh, the, the idea is to, uh, to educate young people so in such a way that they are able to work and to learn all their life in this new environment. In order to, to, to do this, we, we need to give people the, the tools, the intellectual tools, to judge by themselves. The tools, the intellectual tools of autonomy. So it's not that collective intelligence will replace individual or personal intelligence, not at all. Because collaboration in creation of, of knowledge, collaboration in learning, needs personal intelligence, needs individual autonomy. It's not personal autonomy against collaboration, okay? The good collaboration is supported by people who are autonomous. So for me, the, the new literacy is related to 
the, the connection with the data. So you see the, 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 the individual, the, the collectivity, and the data, and the new algorithmic tools. So there is basically three layers. One layer of personal intelligence, one layer of cr uh, critical intelligence of the sources, the, I mean the sources of the data, and one layer of collective intelligence. So when, I, I, when we speak about the new literacy, the digi or the digital literacy, it's not so much about the way to use the computer or this app or this program. Okay. It's the, the, the way, the, it's the, the intellectual discipline in relation to the data and in relation to the new ways to collaborate in the, the algorithmic medium. Now, if we uh, go through all these, uh, these nine cells, okay, you see how it is organized, personal, uh, uh, critic of the sources, collective intelligence, and then you have three columns. One column that is more about the consciousness or the awareness, one that is more about the meaning, and one that is more about the memory. So it's the mind, okay? Okay, so it, 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 it's a kind of um, cognitive analysis of the, the, the skills that we should create uh, or cultivate uh, in our students. So first, we need to teach them to manage their attention. The, of course, this is about uh, stop l uh, watching your Facebook instead of listening to the professor. But it is a little bit more than this. <laughs> okay, first, we, we need to, to choose what are our topics of interest. What, we w what do we want to learn? Okay. If we don't decide that we want to learn this, we will not learn anything. That's why, because if now we say, okay, uh, learning is autonomous. Yes, but if it is autonomous, you have to discipline yourself. So you have to uh, choose your priorities. And then you have to learn to select the relevant or the right sources of information. What does relevant mean? It's not something that is real or, or objective. Relevance is, of course, some, something relative. It depends of what you want to learn, for example. It depends of your context. It depends of, of a lot of things. But you have to evaluate what are the relevant sources for you. So it's a question of judgment. And of course, the sources are not the platforms, okay? because sometimes I listen to some journalists that say, oh, Twitter is not a, a source that can be trusted. Okay. But Twitter is not a source. Twitter is a platform. The sources are people or institution. And when you, 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 do, you don't trust a platform. You trust people or you trust institutions. Once you know what you want to learn, what, once you have uh, selected your sources, then you receive data and you have to interpret the data. And of course, you can use uh, statistical methods to analyze the data. This is very often done in the field of uh, digital humanities, for example. Historians 
or even uh, journalists or people uh, working in, in marketing and so on. People, they are using software to analyze the data. But to analyze the data, to interpret them correctly, you don't need only quantitative methods. You need also hypotheses. You need theories about the way things work. You need to make causal hypotheses. Okay? This is the cause of this. Because if you analyze the data to understand a situation, ultimately to act on this situation, if you want to act, you must understand how it works. What is the cause of what? Okay, so you need causal theories. And finally, you need to maintain your memory that currently is always in the cloud. You, you don't have any more your, the, your uh, repository of data on your hard disk. Okay, it's in the cloud. It, it should be in the cloud, of course, because you need to share your memory. It's a memory. Or to, to give access to the people with whom you work, for example, or the people with whom you learn. So you have a lot, I'm not going into the, the technical details, but you have a lot of applications today that helps you to, to do this. If some people are interested, you can go on my, on my blog, it's called Pierre Levy's blog, and there is a place where you can click, and it's called Curation, and you'll have a list of all the places where I do this data curation. And uh, there is not only the, you, you should not only maintain f this memory physically, you should also maintain it intellectually by categorizing the data in a, consist in a consistent way, okay? Because a memory that is not categorized, it is not very easy to use. Okay? You, you, you should be able to retrieve the information. So these are the, the, the personal skills that are needed to evolve in this new communication environment mm -hmm. and to be efficient in this new communication environment, to be able to efficiently collaborate. But the second level is the critical analysis of the sources. This is very important because ultimately what we want to know is not the information. You don't say, I want to know the information. This has no meaning. What you want to know is the source of information. Okay? And the information gives you signs that help you to understand what is the source. Okay. So the source can be uh, one person, can be a, a social group, can be an institution, but it can be an ecosystem, it can be a lot of things. It can be a city, it can be, you know. This is the real source, and the, it's the source that you want to know. The first thing to do is to diversify the sources on a particular subject, or to, to multiply the, the point of views. Not only one voice, but several voices on the same subject. And then you can cross the different information and see if there are contradictions, if information are confirmed, and so on. So the sources are cri criticizing themselves, okay? But you have to be attentive. Then, instead of looking other point of view, you, you have to be able to understand the categories that are used by this particular source, the theories that are behind its narrative, and finally to identify the narrative itself. Ultimately, we can say that one source or one person or one group or one institution is a particular narrative. What is your story? And then you can compare the narrative of the source and 
the real actions of this source in its environment. Okay, and of course, there can be discrepancies between what the source is saying and what it is doing. That's why I call it the, the pragmatic aspect of the, of the critique. Is the source transparent about its, the, the way it is financed, for example? Uh, is it transparent about its references or the sources of the source? Where, where, where do you get this information? Do you quote your own sources? And ultimately, what is your agenda? Okay. What, what do you want to do? What are you doing here? What are the pragmatic effects of the discourse that you are emitting, of the information that you are sending to us? Okay, this is the critique of the source. And finally, when you have the ability to manage your personal intelligence, when you are able to critique, to criticize the sources, then you can participate to collective intelligence. So collective intelligence is not a tool that is easy to, to use. It is not something that, that is there. It is a goal to reach. Okay? It is what we, what, what we want to do, but we, we have to build it in the mind of the people. So this stigmatic communication, okay, stigmatic communication means indirect communication between people through a common memory, okay? So there are rules for this kind of communication, okay? For example, you, it, it's very simple. You, you don't ask questions to a group where this question has already been asked seven times, okay, or 100 times. Okay. So you, you try to look to the responses that have already been given. So you save the time of the people. So you, you read what people have already written in the memory before uh, writing, because what you write can be completely redundant, for example. So you need a kind of awareness of the en communication environment. Then there is a kind of moral dimension. You have to uh, recognize that you have a lot of power because you are an author, you are a librarian, you are a critic, you can you can do a lot of things that people of the last generation could not do. Okay? You, have, you are empowered. So the, the infosphere or the, or the common memory is an emergence of all the actions that of, of all the people who, who participated in it. Okay? It's, it's an emergence. So we should uh, take responsibility for this. We should realize that what we do when we buy something, when we, we create a link, when we, we put a tag, everything that we do something on the internet, we create this common memory. So it's a responsibility. And this is the last slide. Uh, it's about um, collaborative learning. So you have all this personal intelligence. The IP means intelligentsia personal. And all these people that have the skills that I have just described, they work together to create a common memory. It can be at the scale of, of the small team, it can be a big administration, it can be a city, it can be, okay, the, the, there are the many different possible scales okay, of this process of collective learning. And this common memory, I call it an, a, a repository of explicit knowledge because the data are categorized and evaluated by 
the people, of course, not by specialists or by some external authority. It's, it's an emergent common memory. So we have to imagine that there is a, a particular domain of practice. It can be pedagogy, uh, it can be chemistry, it can be a lot of different things. And th these people are sharing this common area of practice. And in this domain of practice, there are a lot of knowledge that are part of the r r internal reflexes of people that come from their experience, that uh, knowledge that is difficult to explain, or a kind of knowledge that is very closely related to a particular environment. So the challenge is to transform this tacit knowledge into an explicit knowledge. In general, you cannot transform all the tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. It's something that there is always more tacit knowledge than uh, explicit knowledge. Anyway, you can transform some of your tacit knowledge into some explicit knowledge. So you have to decontextualize or to depersonalize this knowledge to make it more abstract in order to share it in the common memory so, uh, so that people will be able to take it and to appropriate it, to contextualize, to, to transform it into their own context, their own practice, so they transform this explicit knowledge into their own tacit knowledge. So you understand that this is a cycle. There is no end. It's a, it's a dynamic process. This is <laughs> what I had to say about collective, intelli collective intelligence. This is, in a way, uh, a kind of, uh, of uh, common structure of collective intelligence. Okay? It's a dynamic structure. There is, in, in the center, you have the common memory and you have the social process that creates knowledge by the interaction between tacit and explicit, all this using the new tools in yeah. the uh, uh, algorithmic medium. As you can see, it's not the, let's say, the, 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 the common model of teaching and learning at school, but maybe we could be a little directive and a little authoritarian in teaching the people the necessary skills to acquire the autonomy that will lead to an efficient, emergent collective intelligence. Okay, thank you.